One match, one flame, one spark, small thing, could have a massive impact. There's so many things in life like that. This, and I hold in my hands here, my favorite hot sauce in the world. It's called Marie Sharp's Habanero Pepper Sauce. It's not made with a tomato base, it's made with a carrot base. And as I hold this and talk about it, my mouth is starting to water. I'm not kidding you. I mean, it just, it's, it's, it's Pavlovian. It's, it's the core of who, of who I am. But anyways, you, know, you go, I, I, if I have eggs or a taco, I put a few drops of this on, and I put, when I use it, I put a few drops on every bite just to make sure you spread it out evenly. But anyways, it's not a sermon about that. But the point is this. Uh, little things can have a huge impact. My mom was five foot tall. Huge impact on my life. And as the years went on, my mom ended up, by, by the time she passed away, she was about 4'11", although she still tried to brag that she was five foot tall still. Uh, but, I, but my mom was a person of strength and, and impact on the lives of the people that were around her. Sometimes great things come in small packages, and little things have a big impact. And in the New Testament of the Bible, there are four little books, the four smallest books of the New Testament, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and Philemon. And they're so small... You could pass right by them just turning a single page. All of them are small enough to fit on one page of the Bible. The entire book of the Bible is less than a page long. So what happens oftentimes with little things is they just get looked over and they get missed. But we're not going to do that at Shoreline. In this four-week series, we're going to spend a week on each of these little books, these small books of the New Testament. As a matter of fact, if you do the Bible reading... I've assigned you to read the entire book of the Bible every day of the week. So if you've been doing that reading, you've read 2 John every day of this last week. So you're already up to speed on things. And if you've done that, you're going to love the fact that I'm going to read the entire book to you again right now in just a moment here in the service. I'll read the entire book of the Bible during the sermon. It'll take me less than two minutes. Uh, in 2 John, there's this big theme. And if we miss it, it's a powerful, life-changing theme. If we miss it, we miss something very important. In 2 John, there's this theme, and I want you to hear this. That there are times when you do this, and you close the door. There are times you say, you know what? That's out of line. That's not right. That's no good. And I have to actually close the door, set boundaries, and put up a blockade. You say, well, that doesn't sound very kind or loving. Well, actually, 2 John is all about love, but it's also all about truth. So you can see up here, I've got love on one side and truth on the other side. And in the middle, I have this wonderful balancing beam. And I'm gonna, I was going to do a back handspring, but I didn't want to show off. But I can do this. Oh, no, stay with it. Okay, this is very exciting. Now watch this. And nail the landing. There you go. So that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> what will we do next? Um, but but this, this issue of love and truth, of truth and love, and this balance between them, this comes out in the book of 2 John. So I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 John. If you have your app or your iPad, or whatever you're using, open up your, your, your Bible app and go to 2 John. And you'll notice it's just it's, it's like a postcard. It's the size of a postcard. It's just tiny. And, and yet there's so much here. I'm going to read, first I'm going to read the first six verses. And I want you to notice something as I read the first six verses. That the word love shows up five times. And the word truth shows up five times in just six verses. If you're really smart, you'll, you'll follow the theme going on here. right? Something's going on. Love and truth. Truth and love. Watch how they fit together. Sometimes it's love and truth. Sometimes it's truth and love. But get the picture of what's being said here because these are critical. And if you have your own Bible and if you have something to write with, you can circle or underline these key words. So here's the letter. To the, uh, the elder, John the elder, to the, el uh, the elder, to the lady chosen by God and her children, whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also those all who know the truth. Because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. It's both a body of truth and the person of Jesus Christ, who is the truth. Verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, who will be with us in truth and love. So now you have truth and love in that order. Verse 4. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing a new command but one we have had from the beginning. 
I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. That has to do with truth there. It's not the word, but it's the concept. As we have heard from the beginning, this command is that you walk in love. Hit the pause button there. Keep your Bibles open. So in this first six verses, five times love, five times truth. And we're going to look at how these relate to each other. But now, now John gets to the heart of the matter. Something's going on. There's a problem happening in this home and probably in the church attached to this home that he's addressing. So look with me at verse 7. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge that Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. In Christian circles, if you want to call a name, you want to get serious, you use the term antichrist. That's about as, that's about as nuclear as you can get. I mean, that, that's the, you know, you're the antichrist. Now, it's not the antichrist, but you are behaving in a way that is antichrist, against Christ. You are functioning like an antichrist. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be awarded, that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If, now, pay attention. This is the key thing. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. And then he shifts to kind of the farewell words. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face. It's very personal. So that our joy may be complete. And the children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. And that's the entire book of 2 John. But in this book, we notice something. Uh, and we can't understand it unless we understand the culture. But what John is saying is, there's people coming to you, and they're wanting to stay in your home. They're wanting to extend them hospitality and invite them in. And he's saying to them, listen, close the door on some people. Because of what they believe, because of what they're teaching, because of the end results of the doctrine that they hold. There are times where you actually close the door. In, in our world, that may not make a lot of sense, but in the ancient world, even outside the Christian world, just in the ancient world, when people would travel... Others would show hospitality by inviting them into their home and giving them food. There, were, there weren't hotels like we have now. And some, people, well, you know, and some people say, well, you know, Jesus, there was no room in the inn. It was probably more like, more like an Airbnb kind of a thing. It was more like a house that somebody would just let you stay in a room. There weren't a lot of formal you know, places to stay, and there weren't restaurants at that time. When people would travel, other folks would just say, oh, you're traveling through? Come on in. And that was just sort of hospitality was part of the culture of the day. But especially among Christians, Christians understood and if other Christians were traveling through, they would open their home and they would show hospitality. And they would provide food and a warm bed. And especially when it was a teacher or a preacher or an evangelist who was doing ministry, they would be invited in and be cared for. But John is saying, hey, there's some preachers and teachers and evangelists, when they come through, don't invite them in. Lock the door. Put up boundaries. And you say, well, that doesn't sound very nice at all. That doesn't sound very Christian. I mean, Christians are loving, Christians are kind. You don't lock the door and close people out. Or do you? Sometimes, with certain people. That's what we're going to think about. That's what we're going to grapple with. Because what's happening here is that we're get, be, receiving these two calls. Here's the first call. It's the call to love. John is calling us to love five times. That word is used in six verses. And the idea is, and the language is actually this, that we should actually, we should walk in love. The way we walk, the way we live should be loving. Because, because God so loved us that he sent his only son. And the, the Bible says that this is love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us and gave his son for us. God begins with love. We, th this is our starting point. Love is critical. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you should walk in love. Your predisposition and your starting point in every situation you face, should be love. Absolutely. We've got to walk in love. And that, that means that there's an accepting heart. That means there's lots of times where we open our doors and say, come on in, how can I serve you? That, that, this side of the equation, this is how Christians live. But there's more in the passage. There's a call to truth. And, and this truth, the word truth is used five times also. I don't think it's an accident that love is used five times and truth is used five times. 
I think that there's a balance going on here to emphasize the idea that these two things have to go together. So, so we're told also to walk in the truth. Know what you believe. And, and you know what? Know what you believe so much, watch now, that you can actually stand firm. I know where I stand. I know what I believe. And I will hold to it. That's, that's part of the call to truth. And here's the tricky part. When you say you know you believe something and you hold to it without compromise, that means at times, in a way, you're standing against something. And we're terrified to do that today. We don't want to sound like we're against anything. But to stand for something, if, if you say, if you say, I am for justice and compassion, then guess what? You're against injustice. That's just how it works. There's certain things that when you stand for something, it means by definition you're standing against something else. And and so as Christians, we we are to walk in love and live in love, but we're also to walk in the truth and live in the truth and know what we believe and hold to what we believe. And that means when we're walking in love, we have open hearts and love and compassion, and there's times we just open the door to people. But when we're walking in truth, we have wisdom and we have discernment, and there's certain points because of the truth and what we believe and what we hold to, there's certain times where we actually close the door. You say, well, it can't be both. Actually, it has to be both. And so here's here's the beauty. There's a need for balance and wisdom. This is why I've got this little balance beam here. Our lives are this journey of learning to walk this journey of love and truth. And here's the problem. Some people, their personality, their temperament, and their lives, they just tend to kind of end up over here. And they're like, oh, I just want to... I want to just love everybody and throw my arms open and embrace everybody and not have to, I don't want to use discernment. Or, I, don't, I, just want to, I just want to love like Jesus loved. But the problem is Jesus actually had boundaries as well. There's ultimate boundaries that have to do with eternity that Jesus has. But some people say, I just want to be this loving person. And other people, their disposition, their temperament, their personality, is, is they're kind of, they're saying, okay, I know that it's love and truth. I know it's both. But I just kind of tend to lean kind of on the, on the truth side. And I'm really good at seeing when somebody doesn't believe the right things and they kind of become the doctrine police and are you measuring up? And, and it become, becomes overbearing because they push love aside. Here, here's where growing and mature Christians live all the time, right here between the two. And we're holding on to love and we're holding on to truth and we're walking with both of these realities in our hearts and our lives. I was thinking about this, and I wanted, I wanted to give you a picture of what this looks like. And, and I was actually reading a commentary. Commentaries are books written by scholars. And like this little book, Second John, one page long, there's commentators that have written like 200 pages on that one page. Brilliant minds that have thought through every word and all the language in the background. And one commentator gave this picture. I love this picture. He said, think of it like this. Love is a river, and truth is the banks of the river. So love is beautiful, but there's, there's, there's boundaries to that love. So I want you to get a picture of this. So, so you see a river up in the mountains, and it's beautiful, and it's attractive. And you go, okay, you can, see, you can see the boundaries. There's banks to that river. And it's just you know, probably great fishing, maybe, some great, maybe some, some great adventures going down there in rafts and stuff. You go, oh, that's beautiful to look at. You can sit on the edge of that river, put your feet in it. It's wonderful. Why? Because there's, there's, there's banks. There's boundaries. But take the same kind of river. At flood stage, when it's been raining and raining and raining and it overflows, now watch the screen. A river that was wonderful and beautiful now begins to be overwhelming. There's no banks. It flows through cities. It flows through homes. And if you've ever been in a place where a river had gone out of the banks, it is death and destruction. The same water, the same river is now no longer beautiful and wonderful and life-giving. It's deadly. Why? It's out of the bounds. It's out of the, the banks are gone and it's just flooding. And, and so what we have to do is say that, that there is love, it's that river flowing, but there's also truth that, keep, that kind of guides and directs our love and gives us wisdom. And that's exactly what's, what's happening here with this woman who has people traveling through town, and she's being told by John, there's some teachers who are false teachers who aren't following Jesus. Close the door. Don't invite them in. Don't be influenced by them, and don't be part of what they're doing. But that's unloving. No, it's not. It's standing in the middle between these things and holding them together. For, for those of you that lean towards the, towards the kind of, I just want to kind of embrace everyone and everything. Here's the warning. Beware 
of undiscriminating love and tolerance. Undiscriminating, unwise, unbounded. You know, I said, well, absolute love and absolute tolerance is the absolute greatest good, right? No. No. And none of us really believe that. Even though that makes, makes, you know, makes a nice bumper sticker, a nice poster, none of us really believes that. I'll give you a picture. This young woman has gone off to college. She's been studying. She's been gone for almost a year. And she comes home for the holidays with her new boyfriend. And she's written about and texted about and talked about her new boyfriend. He's amazing. He's incredible. I love him. I love him. I love him. He's wonderful. I love him. I love him. And, and dad and mom, brothers and sisters, he loves me. He's wonderful. He loves me. He loves me. I love my love. It's all, it's just a love fest. And they come home. And all the family has heard is how much he loves her and how much she loves him. And then he comes into their home and they have five, six hours together around the table, around the living room. And the family members start asking him questions. They start to find out some truth. They start to learn more about him. Well, okay, so, you know, the, the dad says, okay, my daughter's studying this. What are you studying in college? They've been in college. What are you studying? Oh, well, I'm, I'm not going to college anymore. I, I dropped out. Oh, what happened? Well, you know, the, the teachers don't appreciate me. I've, I've got this incredible mind, and I, I know how to, but they just don't get me, and they don't understand me, and so they were, they were unfair in their grades, and so I just finally, I just said enough with them. Oh, okay, well, what, what, kind, of, what, kind, of, what kind of work are you doing? Well, I've had three jobs this last year, but my bosses just don't get me. They don't give me the freedom I need to express myself creatively. And, and he kind of explains about his amazing gifts and how they don't appreciate him. And so I'm not really working right now, but that's okay. That's okay. Your daughter has plenty of money. <laughs> um, so I'll be, don't worry, I'll be fine, right? And the whole family now, okay, okay. I love him. I love him. I love him. He loves me. He loves me. He loves me. It's wonderful. It's part of the story. But they're also discerning. Anybody else here? Anybody picking up some truth? In, is there more to the story, right? Right? Then sitting around the dinner table, one of the family members asks him a little bit of a probing question. And he doesn't like it. And they can see. He's getting hot under the collar. He's getting angry. And, and it shows. And you can this guy's got a little bit of temper flaring up. So finally, he's had enough. And he grabs his girlfriend, this man's daughter, this woman's daughter, these young men and women's sister, and grabs her by the arm and yanks her out of her chair and says, come on, we're leaving. And as he yanks her out of the chair, the, the, the sleeve of her shirt pulls up and they can see the bruises. This isn't the first time he's grabbed her by the arm and yanked her like that. Now hit the pause button. Love. Truth. And this is where we live. And sometimes truth says you close the door. Sometimes truth says this is too dangerous, this is theologically dangerous, physically dangerous. There's sometimes truth says the door gets closed right now on this. We all understand this. We all know this. But, but we struggle when it comes to God's word and our theology and what we believe. We have to understand that we worship a God who is ultimately, amazingly, unspeakably loving beyond our comprehension. But we also worship a God when Jesus came, the Bible says, Jesus came in love and truth, in grace and truth, both together. And so we also worship a God who not only gives us the truth and speaks truth to us, he is the truth. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ is the truth. So we have to stand in this balance, and we have to stand in this balance in all aspects of our life. So, if you're a note taker, I want to give you four just kind of quick, simple lessons. When we're done with this message, if anybody for the rest of your life says, tell me about the book of 2 John, you're going to go, oh, it's about, it's, about, it's about love, it's about truth, it's about the balance, and it's about sharing this with the next generation, because that's what's going on here. Share it, just pass this on, let this be known, all right? So here's, here's your four big lessons. Big lesson number one from the small book. Begin with love always. Start, our, our starting place as Christians is love. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example, just, just real life. Imagine that you're raising a little toddler, a little boy or girl who's a toddler. The starting point with a little toddler should always be love. God's starting point with us as spiritual toddlers is love. So we begin with love. Okay, that's the lesson number one. Start with love. Lesson number two, know and hold to the truth tenaciously. Know what you believe and believe it with strength and with conviction. Take a toddler, again, as an example. So here's the same little toddler, and you're being loving, and you're being caring. But also you want to speak the truth. So this little, little toddler loves to ride their tricycle right near the top of this staircase that's all cement stairs. 
And because you love that toddler, you give boundaries. You say, honey, don't ride your tricycle near the top of the stairs. If you fall down the stairs, it, you will get really, really hurt. If not, break your neck. And you, I mean, you're, 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 you're putting boundaries there. Why? Because you love this toddler, but you put boundaries to that river, right? And that, that's, that's what you do when you love. That, the toddler comes over and wants to reach up, and you're cooking something, and wants to reach up and grab the, the, the cool, pretty flame on the stove. And what do you say to that toddler in one word? What do you say? Hot, Hot stop, no, take your pick, right? You say, don't, no, why? Why? Because you're mean and unloving, right? No, because love demands boundaries when there's truth. And, and, and that, that's how we live our lives. We understand this, but it, it has to go beyond that to, to our understanding of God and faith and how we live our lives. I remember being in a restaurant, and I've shared this before at Shoreline, but it's such, it's such a simple, powerful picture. I was sitting in a restaurant with one of my sons, and I was actually with my son for some one-on-one -on -one dad son time, but I wasn't really paying attention to him. I was watching a couple tables over this mom and her son because this little boy was completely out of control. He was mouthy. He was rude. Everyone was watching this drama, and the mom was doing nothing to deal with him. Loving him so much, she let him run wild kind of a thing. And as I'm sitting there watching this, I get a poke in my side, and it's my son, and I realize he's watching this, and he's watching me. And he's watching this. And so I looked at him and said, oh, I'm sorry, buddy. And he, he goes, and I looked at him and I realized he was watching too. And here's what my son said to me. He asked me this question. He said, Daddy, why doesn't that mommy love her son? That's what he asked me. I, so I thought about it and I was kind of like, okay. I, I said, well, I said, why do, you, why do you say that? And here's what he said. He said, if she loved him, she wouldn't let him act like that. He said, if she loved him, she'd put, some, she'd put a bank on that river. <laughs> She'd put, some, she'd put some boundaries there. And actually, it led to a great conversation about how much I love my children, but also I love them enough to understand that love and truth go hand in hand. And, and, and then, and then there's, there's, there's the third lesson, and it's simply this. Strive for balance led by the Holy Spirit. When you walk in love, when you walk in truth in every aspect of life, you, you try to find this, this, this balancing act where you're kind of staying with love and truth in, in both of these things. And, and I, when I thought about that, I thought about another one of my sons teaching him to ride his bike and talk about learning balance as a little kid. And we actually lived in a little parsonage at that time. And a parsonage is like a little house on the church property. This is a church I served in Michigan years ago. And we were in this parsonage. And so we had this giant parking lot. And I taught my son to ride his bike in the parking lot. And anyone who's done that with a child, you, know, you hold it as long as you can. You finally let him go. You try to teach him how to brake before you let him go. It's just a good point. I forgot that with my first one. Uh, but you, but you, <laughs> that's really true. Um, but anyways, um, that's another sermon. But, I, but you, know, you, you get him going. And, and you, 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 but you give some bounce. You say, okay, listen. So I said, listen, on Monday through Friday, you can ride your bike in the church parking lot. But watch out for cars. And when you come around this corner, look out because cars come. And I give him all these instructions. I said, whatever you do. There's a drive that went down from our house and from the church right into the street that was kind of like Garden Road. Not, not tons of cars, but cars that come along there fast. So I just said, whatever you do, never ride your bike down into the street. Well, one day, I'm walking from the church building over to our house, over to the parsonage. And as I'm walking over, I see my son come right out of the garage on his bike, go straight down the driveway, and right out into the street. And so out of love for him, I gave him a big hug, and I said, I love you, buddy. You know, that, that, that's probably not a good idea, but don't worry about it. Right? No. no, I did not. We had a conversation. We had an encounter. I'm not going to get into the details. But he never rode out of the street again. Little boundaries, little bank on that river, right? Um, but this is the balance that we, we, we travel, that we go down. And number four, big lesson from a small book. Teach the next generation to do the same. Boy, we are in a time where we've got to teach the next generation that, that, that the love of God is so powerful. We've got to live out love with greater passion and greater commitment. Amen? We've got to show the love of Jesus in all we do. But the, the, the need for truth and boundaries is just as important. And we've got to hold to that as well. And when we hold to that, some people won't understand. And some people won't like it. But we hold the truth because God is truth. And this is the journey as Christians. We stand in this middle place and we balance these two things. And so I want to just think about 2 John, and I want to talk a little bit about your life and about Shoreline Church, and what it looks like to walk in love and to show the love of Jesus in all things, but to walk in the truth and to have boundaries and to know what you believe and why you believe it and to hold to what you believe. So, love for us as, a, as individually and for us as a church, we need to walk in love. Shoreline Church is a church where when somebody walks in here, you are welcome right where you are. 
anybody, everybody. Some say amen. That's the church. When I first walked into a church, I came because they had a gambling casino night. I was 15 years old. I was told they had a gambling casino night and there'd be girls there. And both were true. And that's why I went. If somebody would have said, what are your pure motives for coming to church? They weren't pure. But can I tell you, that church loved me right where I was. And because they loved me where I was, look where I am today. Praise God. Praise God they love me where I was at. We are that kind. We're going to say as a church, when somebody walks in here, whatever your background, whatever your history, whatever our doctrines or beliefs or our thoughts about things, our starting point is always love with open arms and open heart. Amen? Amen. But we are also a church that holds to the truth. And there are things that we believe. And as much as we open the door, and we will always open the door, there are circumstances and times where we will actually, and everybody look up here, let me, you gotta, where we will actually close the door. And so, and so, here's an example. As a church, we have a doctrine statement. It's on our website. It's not hidden in any way. It's on our website, on the first page of our website. There's core things we believe. We believe this is the word of God and that it's true. If we didn't believe this, I'd be gone fishing, playing, go- playing golf, or doing something else. This, if I didn't believe this was true, I'd be doing something else. Trust me. We believe this book is true. We believe that salvation comes through Jesus Christ's life and death on the cross and his resurrection. Amen? Yeah. We believe this. We don't apologize. We're a, we're a Christian church. This is what we believe. This is where we stand. We plant our flag on this. We bet our lives on it. Right? We hold to those things. And so we have core beliefs. So now, somebody comes to Shoreline Church, and they come in, and they, and, and they don't agree with those core beliefs, and that's not what they're at, but they're loved here, and they're part of things, and they're welcome to come, and they're part of life. But then, then they say, well, listen, I don't believe that Jesus died on the cross. I don't believe he rose again. I don't believe salvation comes from him. I don't really believe the Bible. But I'd love to volunteer to be a third grade teacher in, in, with your kids' ministry. Okay? What, at Shoreline, here's what we're going to say. Hey, we love you. There's things you can get involved in. But teaching our children is not going to be one of those. We're going to just, we're going to lovingly, watch me now, but we're going to close the door to that. That's not going to happen. Why? Because we're not going to have somebody teaching your children and your grandchildren something opposite of what the Christian church has believed for 2,000 years. Amen. But that, that's unloving. You're so cruel. No. We live here. So we're going to love, but we're also going to say there's certain truth that we hold to. So if somebody says, well, I'd love to be asked to be on Shoreline's church board, but they're not a member of our church. You can't be on Shoreline's leadership team or church board if you're not a member of the church. Why? Because when you become a member of the church, you sign our core belief statement. And you're saying, I, I believe in this about Jesus, this about life and death and the word of God. There's a core that we believe in, that we agree on, and we're not going to put somebody in leadership over this congregation who doesn't agree. Now, I know for some people, it's like, well, that, makes, that actually makes, in our world today, it makes people, some people feel uncomfortable. But I need to tell you, this is where we live. We live in this, in this balance of the two. We even go so far, and I had a great conversation with a couple after the first service. There are certain materials and curriculum that we don't use at Shoreline because they're written by somebody whose view of the Bible or theology doesn't align with what we believe the Bible teaches. And I somebody saying, well, that, that seems like you know, you're just controlling what people can be exposed to. Here's the reality. I read, very, I, I read and listen to podcasts. I read atheists and agnostics and people I totally disagree with. I read from Christians I agree with and Christians I don't agree with. I read lots of things. I, I love to learn. But we're not going to take a curriculum for somebody who disagrees with what our church believes and teach it to your children or teach it to... We're just not going to do that. We have boundaries. Sometimes we close the door. Is everybody following me? Okay. I said, man, this is a lot for a little teeny book, Second John. Uh, but, this, but what's John saying? Don't let them in your house. Close the door. Don't take part in what they're doing. Amen. Generally, starting point is love. But sometimes truth demands that we put boundaries up and then we close doors. There's a book I'm going I'm to spend, and you can pray for me in this. I'm going to spend probably 30 to 40 hours in the next two weeks studying a book and resources from a pastor who I appreciate and who we've used this pastor's materials, but they've just written a book that in many ways, it seems to me, questions the validity of the word of God. And so I'm going to spend about 30 to 40 hours of my next two work weeks studying that. And if I feel like this person's writing and teaching where they're going right now is compromising the word of God, I'm going to have a couple of our other pastors and a couple of our leadership team members read the book with me, talk about it, and we might decide to say, we're not going to use that person's resources at Shoreline anymore. Can I I tell you? Because that's what a pastor does. I love this church, and our pastors love this church. 
And, 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 and we are going to start with love every time. But we are not going to give up on truth, and we're not going to compromise. And, and, and for, for some of you, even, even and, and, and here, can, I, can I challenge you? Will you pray for the next generation and speak to the next generation about the fact that, that love is glorious and truth is glorious, and these two locked together make life rich and meaningful? As Christians, we have to know what we believe. So, hey, have you ever read the book of 2 John? Do you have any idea what it's about? You're going to say, oh, yeah. Yeah, my pastor got kind of fired up about this, like, like his habanero hot sauce there. Uh, it's, about, it's about truth. It's about love. It's about how these come together and how we walk this journey of loving and believing in truth. And our disposition is to always open the door, but when we have to, We'll close the door to certain things because that can glorify God and protect his people and protect his church and protect our hearts and protect our homes. Whew. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we, yeah, amen. Um, Lord Jesus, we are a people of love and a people of grace. We have been just marinated and saturated with your love and your grace and you've been so good to us but also Jesus you are truth you are the truth and you spoke things that were so clear and so precise about how about what life should look like and so we want to be people of of love and people of truth so our prayer is that in our homes in our families in our personal lives and in our church we we will walk that balance beam of loving and caring and opening our hearts and our, our lives to all people, but also know what the truth is and with firmness and with kindness, hold to the truth. And Lord, if sometimes that means we close the door, let us do it with gentleness and love, but let us do it with strength and firmness in the name of Jesus. We pray this for his glory. And everyone said?